I'm happy to take uh, questions from the audience. Yes. I have a question for Professor Sushigai. Um, I wonder, if, <coughs> pardon me, I wonder if you could speak to how the impression of Tohoku um, in Japan might affect both um, might affect both the way people experience the disaster and also how people perceive the difficulty in accessing it. In, in my limited experience, Tohoku is seen as a place that's very far away and hard to get to, and usually is where your grandparents live. Um, and I'm just wondering if that sense of alienation of being outside the center, of being the kind of place that would have to accept having a nuclear plant, um, might affect people who are trying to recover. And if by the same token, people from the center in Kanto or in Kansai might also have a kind of impression of a distance that might also be psychological. I think it's hard to answer the question because the I repeatedly say the it's ongoing, but the culture is different. It's it's true. The the Toho people they are the very much a, how to say this. ホワイトンシャイ。いやいや、ホワイトンシャイ。日本語で言えばいい。うん、お、お楽しいんですよ。はい。はい。岩田さん、ジャパニーズ。いや。うん。で、アーミンでカンサイエリア。で、で、ピ
Uh, uh, we've already had four in the 21st century. Now, well, why is that? Uh, well, that's partly because we're piling up people in high-risk zones. Uh, we have lots more people in areas of high seismic risk. So I think that is something to look at. Uh, but again, one does not want to optimize against the thousand-year event. Optimize against the hundred-year event, and and that will that will serve you well in terms of uh, developing the right kind of risk portfolio. Please. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was an event like this. Raise the microphone, please. Okay. Sure. Um. A question for uh, Professor Leonard. Um, I don't know if there was an event like this uh, when, when the Haiti earthquake took place, but, and, and, but I just whether there was or not, um, would your have remarks have been different on that day? And is there something invisible? Is there, are there issues of things of governance or um, <clears throat> knowledge or other factors of culture or things that, would, that are somehow at, at work here in, in, in shaping our perception of what the response might, might be and what kind of recovery is possible and, and just I, I, I sense this kind of invisible strength of, of Japan in some way and I'm just wondering if if you could comment on that. Yes, again I think it's an excellent excellent question. When I spoke about the resilience of the Japanese people and culture, part of what I wanted to refer to is Japan is a very large and very wealthy country with huge resources of physical capital and financial capital and especially human resources, human capital. People who know how to do stuff. People who know, engineers, people who know how to rebuild systems and people who are going to be very ingenious. So the resources that Japan brings to this event, large scale epoch making event as it is, it still has affected only a relatively small fraction of the overall country and it damaged a relatively small fraction of, of the overall capital stock. Now it's disrupted a lot of other things. It's disrupted the transit system, it, the electric grid and, and rolling blackouts are a huge disruption for production. We're now starting to see supply chain shortages in the U.S. as a result of parts that were expected on a just-in-time basis from <coughs> plants that are having trouble getting their uh, production restarted in Japan. So we will see effects like that not just in Japan but elsewhere. But again, I'm predicting a high degree of ingenuity and a more rapid uh, return in that than, than we would uh, otherwise expect. Um, just to, I'll give you a, a quick example of that. A again, the uh, September 11th experience in the U.S. Uh, when the Twin uh, Towers went down in southern Manhattan, they severed 20 million phone lines because uh, all, all the telephone switches were in that area. Uh, the prediction about how long it would take to get, this, getting the stock market back online was thought of as a really big deal because after all it was capitalism had been attacked and we didn't want anybody to think they could shut down the, the main market of, of uh, exchange. I don't know why people thought that was so important, but they did. Uh, so really important to get this back online. Predictions? At least a month. A month would be optimistic. 30 days. Uh, probably two months. That was, those were the predictions. How long did it take? Four days. Why? Because a bunch of Verizon truck drivers showed up in southern Manhattan and started clipping wires together. And they knew much better than anybody would have predicted how to rebuild that kind of system. That, I think, is what you're going to see in Japan. The, the difference between Japan and Haiti is striking in virtually every way. Uh, Haiti had not seen an event of this form in 250 years. As a result, it had uh, essentially forgotten to build buildings that were seismically resistant. And as a result, a, a very large number of multi-story, unreinforced masonry buildings collapsed, and 200,000 people died in the first five minutes of that event. Now, that's just a radically different outcome than you see in Japan due to the level of preparation and the fact that there are recurrent seismic events in Japan and Chile. Chile had the same experience. Chile has also had a large earthquake since Haiti with a relatively small number of, of lives lost. Um, so the, and uh, for the final comment, the, uh, the government of Haiti was weak before the event and essentially, and, and happened to be centered right where in the middle of the impact zone in the, in the Haiti event. Uh, Japan is completely different than that. Japan is, has a robust government, it has lots of people who criticize different aspects of it, but it's a robust, functioning, effective government at the central level and at the decentralized level. Uh, Japan will, will, we will learn lessons from how to be effective in recovery from watching the Japanese people undertake this. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Goli a question about the uh, technology by which nuclear plants are constructed. Uh, I gather that some questions have been raised about the 
particular kind of technology that was used to develop the plants in Japan and Yankee Nuclear and um, Pilgrim and so forth. Is there going to be serious rethinking about, because I understand there are alternative methods by which um, future nuclear plants could be constructed. Right. I'm, I alluded to um, uh, the one plant uh, that's now being completed in Japan, which would not have been nearly so vulnerable to this earthquake. Uh, and the reason it lacks this vulnerability is it gets its post-shutdown cooling using natural convection. After the Three Mile Island accident, uh, there was about a decade of consideration of accident-proof reactor concepts. And uh, they ultimately went nowhere in the marketplace until the last five years. But they primarily tried to make use of uh, passive uh, phenomena such as uh, gravity to drive cooling or thermal radiation as opposed to active systems as they're called, using human actions, using uh, fuels, using moving parts uh, as with the electric system. Uh, a sec a second uh, plant of the type I alluded to is also under construction in China, and two more are in the pipeline, as I understand it. Uh, this accident will doubtless uh, be a spur to uh, technology in that category, uh, and the, the particular design being pursued in China is not the only candidate. Um, right now, we don't require use of passive safety features, and as I said in my remarks, we can expect that consideration of such requirements uh, may come up. Um, the downside to them is that they tend to be less flexible, less capable, but if done right, more reliable. And so there's, there's a trade-off there. Um, most of the nuclear technology on offer today commercially <coughs> still relies very heavily on active safety features, sometimes with very high levels of redundancy, though. Just as a follow-up, could there be systems built that we have both active and passive uh, yeah. systems? Yeah, you can always combine them. It's, it's a matter of cost, essentially. And uh, as uh, Professor Leonard has said, it's really a question of at what level of risk do you want to uh, draw your boundary. Other questions? Hi. Uh, yes, I'd like to go back to the question of information and uh, Professor Suchita and any of the other panelists. Um, it's an ongoing crisis. I wonder how you perceive, at least when you were last there, uh, the information flow from the government officials and the varying levels of government as well as the company officials uh, and if it's improving and then secondarily what kind of lessons there might be about communication. Uh, I covered Three Mile Island as a reporter and it was criticized widely the official information at, available at the time but we did not uh, have cell phones or the internet at the time. I've been following this on Ustream, the Japanese television, and so I'm wondering um, both within Japan and without uh, the information that's being received, if you see it's improving, and how we might improve or learn from this both uh, within Japan and, and in the rest of the, of the world. Well, the basic statistics the uh, to to collect the data, basic statistics is uh, uh, the local government's responsibility, local government, and the local policemen gather the information, and they send the, the information to the central government. And in this case, local government wiped out. There is no one who has a responsibility to collect statistics. That is the main problem in this crisis. But what about the company as well and, and the information that was being given out? And, and there, I think there's been reports of anger within Japan as well about, as you said in your presentation, the leaders are not always respected. I'm just wondering what the feeling is uh, about that right now. Well, well, the... We have many big companies in Japan, but it's located in uh, the located in the Tokyo areas. 
We have no big companies except Tohoku Entrance Company. Uh, and the, so, major company has no antennas or branch offices there. So, the, the company cannot uh, collect the information either. I, I want to go back to one remark I made, which is that uh, we sh we sh in evaluating the flow of information, we should really be sensitive to what the people involved at the site probably don't know. And if I'm correct, then a, a cautious person would be fairly reticent uh, about making statements. And my own belief is that they're only now beginning to get a good idea of what the real situation is. That doesn't mean that they couldn't have been less economical with, with the truth, but I, I don't see, um, I, I've dealt with Japanese organizations in the nuclear enterprise for about 25 years, and so from that you get some idea of what they're like, and um, I, I think uh, a simply lack of knowledge could explain a lot of what has gone on in the information flow. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I, I have been kind of surprised and puzzled about um, the evident anger concerning Tokyo Electric Power Company. Now, full disclosure, I've taken money from Tokyo Electric Power Company. Uh, I've had research projects that they funded, and I've been their guest for dinner at different occasions. But over that time, I've also gotten to know the people and had some ad idea concerning their attitudes and so on. And, and I have not seen anything in the way that they have gone about their work that is different than I've observed with other international utility companies. So they seem to be serious and trying to get good performance. And I've suspected that what we've been seeing is more a reflection of perhaps attitudes within the Japanese society concerning large organizations in general, uh, rather than that particular company. And uh, my colleagues on the panel, I'm sure, can give us much better information than that. But I think it's, it's rather easy in hindsight to kind of pile on criticism, which um, perhaps is off the mark. Yeah. I'd just like to comment on the same thing, because I've had, coming from a very different academic uh, perspective about this, very much the same reaction. Uh, I don't detect that uh, people are trying to hide information. I think they don't have it. Uh, the essence of a true crisis situation, which means something that has a high degree of novelty, uh, if this has anything, it has a high degree of novelty, the essence of such a situation is that people don't understand, the people in the middle of it don't understand what's going on. They can't understand what's going on. They understand how to operate a nuclear power plant within the normal control bounds of temperature, pressure, electric flow, cooling, all the different, it's a hugely complex system. And they know how to operate it within the usual control bounds. It is designed, if it fails, to fail in a way that doesn't create a catastrophic accident. But in the process of being dam having multiple subsystems damaged by the tsunami and then by each other, by the way in which it's operating, the operators literally have no clear idea of what the state of the, re of the reactors are or what their other systems are. They couldn't possibly know. There have been so many different forms of failure, and the sensor systems and everything else are blacked out at the same time that the, they go off the grid, so the station blackout. So there is a tremendous level of uncertainty. Now, that's also, on the one hand, that is a, a reasonable defense for the people who are giving us information and, and having it turn out to be wrong, or not giving us very much information because they don't have it. On the other hand, it's also what's really scary about an event like this. Because if they don't understand the situation that they're managing, how can we be confident that it's not going to go hugely awry? Well, I think, if, if Professor Gulley can, can correct me if I'm wrong about this, in this domain we are relying in part on design, on a fail-soft design. So that if, even in the worst case, where there is a significant meltdown of the cores of the reactors, as we had at Three Mile Island, these systems are designed not to fail catastrophically, to be able to contain that in a way that is, in effect, reasonably contained. Now, the problem, so that's, that's the hope, that's the upside. Uh, the, the problem with that is that it's hard to be confident of that after you've had a 9.0 earthquake in the vicinity that there hasn't been some breach of the, the vessels or some uh, damage to the containment process. And in fact, we have seen more uh, some releases that would uh, suggest that some, some uh, failure of integrity, but not a catastrophic failure. Is, is that a fair description, of, or, or at least in the right direction? You get it right. Okay. 
So, so I think on the one hand, we have to understand that the people who are trying to, to, to manage this problem and to bring it basically to, back to stability are doing so with a, a, a very high level of uncertainty. And they're trying to do the very best they can. The, the fact that they're introducing seawater as a coolant uh, is a clue here. Uh, in law enforcement, we refer to that as a clue. It's something that indicates uh, something going on. So uh, that is obviously an extreme measure, obviously improvised, and it itself creates damage. It means that the pumping systems that they have run the seawater through are not going to function as effectively as they would otherwise. So you have this cascading set of problems and improvised uh, solutions. The hope is that they're coming back to stability and that we haven't had a catastrophic failure. Uh, that's the design, reliance on design. But again, it's also the part that's scary because you can't be entirely confident that you know how to manage something where you, no one's ever tried to operate a, a nuclear power complex in exactly this state before. And they also don't know exactly what state that is. I will briefly uh, uh, so you add to this some comment. Because actually, I got an, a lot of information from Tokyo Electric in this case. Uh, as the professor uh, said, uh, they don't. Uh, the uh, typical guy said that uh, the actually as far as the Fukushima 2, the uh, number 2, Daini, actually because the uh, damage is so serious, not so serious, so that they have uh, the luxury to send the information to headquarters. But when it comes to Fukushima Daiichi, the first nuclear power plant, actually even headquarters could not get the information. Because first of all, that in the middle of night, there is a blackout, so they cannot, they can only see with the flashlight the gauge, and uh, at the same time, the, all the people are at the risk of their lives. They are concentrating on trying to control the damage. There is no luxury to inform in, any information to others. And uh, if I may add, the, although actually I don't want to uh, defend the government stance, but uh, actually I was so much Im impressed. They, they, uh, it's a kind of uh, something. That, a learning processes. Right now, if you uh, 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 reach the website of uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the Residential Office, they re uh, actually routinely, twice a day, they inform they got. And as the professor said, that actually, uh, uh, said that actually, there's a lot of confusion in collecting information as for the death tolls or something like that. So that they collect, uh, they put conflicting information. This is what got from the police agency, this is what got from fire department. So that actually right now actually they have been, uh, the, however, in, uh, the, if not perfect, they made a lot of progress, I think. Thank you. I can't resist, even as a neutral moderator, adding my two cents. Uh, because I think the issue that was raised in the question is a really important one about conveyance of information. And I think it's worthwhile to focus on the dilemma faced both by the senior leaders of TEPCO and also by the senior leaders of Japan. There, is enormous, there are enormous problems in knowing what's going on. Uh, and there is a temptation to go in one of two directions if you're in a position like that under conditions of, of rampant uncertainty. One of them is to mouth pieties and platitudes about safety and the good design of the system and to reassure people in fear that they will panic or that there will be reactions that are, that are quite negative. And on the other hand, there is sometimes a temptation to be extremely cautious, not to say anything that uh, you can't back up uh, and, in, and to release very little information. Um, I don't know what's happening in Japan exactly because I don't understand Japanese and haven't seen the news media coverage. So I'm speaking more in generalities than from deep knowledge of what happened in this instance. Um, but I think that the confounding difficulty of these kinds of situations in today's world is that officials have to weigh their reaction in this regard, either to be um, boundlessly optimistic or to be very reticent to express their opinions against the fact that there is enormous 24 by 7 media coverage, not just by traditional newspapers and radio stations and TV stations, but also um, by a proliferation of cable uh, access uh, blogs, uh, and now increasingly social media, the ability uh, to film these events and to show things uh, that may be in the cameras or the, of, uh, of individual citizens, but may be beyond the can of the people at, this, at the central level. And so the, uh, in order to maintain public 
uh, confidence and legitimacy as leaders, there's a huge challenge to figure out how to respond to the, the uncertainty at the same time that there's lots of noise, much of it incorrect, much of it being spoken by experts uh, and pseudo-experts about this. And I think what the lesson of this is the importance of being prepared, uh, one form of preparedness for emergencies is public affairs preparedness, to have skilled people, to have the capacity to transmit information with graphics, uh, to be able to have people who can turn technical uh, situations into, uh, I was going to say common English, common Japanese, uh, and to, uh, uh, in general, be able to communicate effectively with the public and to be upfront about what's known and what is not known. Uh, and because that, in some ways, is the greatest reassurance to the public to tell them the truth and to acknowledge the places where information is uncertain. Other uh, questions? It builds on what you had just said. Um, one of the, it's an anecdote, but uh, still striking. And this is the third, for me, the third of these big nuclear crises. And the thing that I've noticed is that among the media, at least that I pay attention to, the amount of hysteria and misinformation is much lower than we saw with Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Um, uh, having said that, I'll also say I'm avoiding the more sensational part of the media and the blogosphere. And yesterday I did come across a deliberate attempt to deceive, uh, where there was a radiation isoplet put out, disguised to look as if it came from the NRC, and it was clearly telling lies. So it's not unalloyed, but from what I've seen, this, this one actually seems to be handled in a, in a more facts-oriented and accurate way, for what it's worth. Part of the reason this might be better than Three Mile Island was that the movie The China Syndrome came out literally two weeks before the Three Mile Island meltdown. Uh, but I, what I wanted to pick up on the same point. I think one of the lessons for us also, people who are interested in public policy, is a lesson about the precision of language. I think one of the reasons that it's been confusing is that people have conflated, and this may also be partly a problem of translation, people have conflated meanings of different words. So the word meltdown has been used from everything from a minor uh, extra uh, excess heat event inside a single uh, fuel rod that has caused damage to that rod, which is actually a meltdown, it's a meltdown of a fuel rod, uh, is ranged from that, which is a minor event which will damage the reactor and maybe make it unusable and maybe cause an economic loss, but it is, creates no real danger to anyone. Uh, and, and that same term has been used to apply to something which is a breach of two levels of containment and a massive release of high level radi radioactivity into the atmosphere which we have not seen, but which people have been saying. You know, meltdown has occurred and that could lead to. And I suppose it's technically true that it could lead to, but it's a long chain from one of those to the other. And so the, the imprecision in the way the language is being used it is a real harm to us, because you know, many of us have been trying to figure out what's been happening inside and trying to get more precise information. I'm sure you've had that experience, Professor Golay. And, and uh, the, the way in which it's being described, partly it's being described by people who don't fully understand the mechanics, let alone what the event is. Uh, so uh, not too surprising that what that implies is we are operating in a level at a level of very high uncertainty, which is part of the problem of dealing with, with large-scale events like this. Uh, I count seven comments from the front of the room uh, in answer to one question, so it's only fair to go back to the uh, audience, please. Actually, I would like to go back to the uh, follow-up uh, one point. Uh, Prime Minister Khan got really irritated by the information lag from TEPCO, to, uh, which was sent to the government. So on March 15th, which was uh, four, like, four days after the, uh, the earthquake, TEPCO and the government created a UNITE um, headquarter to, to uh, be res uh, responsive, uh, to be uh, responsible for the uh, for this event, and that actually helped Japanese citizens to calm down and to. Uh, and to uh, think, act uh, in order. And uh, yesterday, Japanese government also uh, announced that some of the uh, government officials are pl uh, planning to create a unite uh, effort, a agency of uh, disaster relief and rec rec reconstruction. So uh, more information will be centralized, and uh, they will work effectively with the uh, more decentralized organizations, organizations as well. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? So anything in 
United States, especially in the post-September 11th era, we have a really, I mean, maybe this is arguable, but a fairly effective federal emergency management system, and, you know, there's centralized power and then fusion centers at the state level and a, a good network of information. Does something like this exist in Japan prior to this uh, incident? Do you have a, a, a FEMA? Federal Emergency Management Agency. Basically, yeah, basically, actually, after the tragic earthquake of Kobe, uh, they draw up the so-called uh, the emergency system and dispatch system. At the same time, actually, although I don't, actually, I don't, free, I want to flee protect the government level, but uh, this time, actually, huge dispatch of uh, the self defense forces, ten thousand people, well, swiftly dispatched to the uh, disaster areas. So at the same time, actually, uh, government issued uh, the, some co uh, uh, directions to uh, some sort of a uh, coordinated uh, the uh, uh, troops, uh, so that the, uh, we have the not completely comparable FEMA, but uh, we have uh, some sort of the equivalent one. The, the basic idea of you know, the, our safety philosophy is to prevent the accident, to cope. We, we are not good at coping with the crisis, but we are good at preventing the crisis occurring. Then the, the reason the you know, confusion is very simple for us Japanese. The reason is earthquake tsunami was bigger than we expected. The, we prepared the, you know, we prepared the worst case, and we prepared the system to pr prevent the not all kinds of worst case. But this crisis exceeded the, our prediction. For example, we have the Onangawa <coughs> nuclear power plant. The, it is closer than the Askai's point, but it was safe because it was located on the hill. It was elevated 15 meters high, and the tsunami didn't attack. For a three-mile island, there was no tsunami. And the, our engineer didn't expect nuclear power plant was attacked by tsunami, but it did. So they got into confusion. That's all. Thank you. There's a question over here. I was wondering if uh, coal fusion technology, if it's a hoax, if it's not a hoax, why don't scientists develop more, learn more about it? So far, it's uh, something uh, which isn't uh, reproducible and which has so far um, come nowhere close to its initial hype. And right now, there's a base, no basis uh, available upon which to plan to do anything with it. We have time for two more questions. Uh, Professor Tuchita, you mentioned that this was not something that had been perceived of as possible or it exceeded expectations, and Professor Leonard mentioned the idea of novelty. And I was wondering if there's a perception among the Japanese people that it is something that should have been prepared for. After Katrina here, there was a lot of talk that we should have been ready for a, that kind of a levee breach or a flood, and I was wondering among the Japanese people if, this was, if people realized that this is something that was impossible to think about, or if um, it's perceived as impossible to fathom. Well, the, we have several Japanese here, so it's my idea that the, we Japanese are disgusted about our leaders because they couldn't predict the reality. They couldn't predict the, what happened in their world. So the, what we discussed it is that point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah uh, it's important to note that there was protection provided against loss of off-site power uh, and the uh, earthquake.
earthquake shaking and the tsunami. It simply wasn't enough. It wasn't as if those things had not been recognized, but simply the degree was much uh, stronger, as Professor Leonard, I think, described it very accurately. Um, so. so I would say the same thing about the BP oil spill. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people have concluded coming out of the BP oil spill was that the U.S. was obviously underprepared for a massive oil spill. We used to have enough oil boom to surround the oil. Now, there's several things wrong with that argument, the first of which is that oil boom doesn't help you to fix all oil spills. But, the, but to me, the bigger systematic error is this. There has to be a threshold which, if the event exceeds it, you are going to be beyond the capabilities that you arranged. You cannot have a warehouse full of an infinite amount of oil boom. You cannot have a tsunami wall that is infinitely high. So there's always a chance that whatever height you set it at, it's going to get breached. So you also have to have a way of trying to cope. And our uh, research suggests that the way to do that is by a decentralized system that helps to support resilience. And I think we're going to learn a lot in the next years watching the Japanese people demonstrate what resilience is all about and drawing on the assets, the human capital, the physical capital, uh, and their ingenuity. And I hope we'll learn lessons about how we can uh, improve resilience elsewhere as well, because that's an important part of our, of our asset, our toolkit, if you will, of dealing with really large-scale events. I have time for one more question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, there is actually a statistics that only 12% of uh, Japanese uh, municipalities at the coastal area adopt the tsunami evacuation maps. So actually the tsunami preparedness is not so, uh, not so well in, in comparison to the uh, building codes implementation. So the enforcement and this, this and the second thing is I think uh, <coughs> Professor Leonard also mentioned about uh, the necessity to build the construction to protect the uh, coastal, but uh, if you read from the economists, there is actually a statement from a, a, an old man in the, in the city close to Miyagi, and he says that we have been told that uh, all the tsunami walls can protect us, so they didn't want to evacuate. So you have an issue of the uh, old population here, but, but you have also an issue of uh, the willingness to evacuate. Uh, and there was a survey in 2002. The willingness to evacuate in the areas like Miyagi was very low. Only 8% people says that they want to evacuate when the tsunami happened, while 85% says that they're, they're not willing to. And simply like 45% of this, 85% uh, says that they don't want to evacuate at all. So you have lots of issues about the tsunami before, and I think that's all my comments. Thank you.